Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Louis D'Souza here. Today is Monday, February the 25th, 2019. It's 8 a.m. in New York, 5 a.m. in Los Angeles, 1 p.m. in London, Sydney, Australia is at 12 midnight, but wherever you are in the world, thank you for tuning in for another episode of LOA Today, your daily dose of happy, and uh, we're happy to get the week off to a uh, energetic start this week. We're going to be doing something a little bit different because we have, uh, well, Louis, I should say, has brought in a guest to uh, interview who is a very energetic person. I've seen her videos. Let me tell you, this lady works up a storm when she's playing. <laughs> she's a violinist, but I'm not going to tell you any more about it. I'm going to let Louis tell her. So first of all, Louis, how you doing? I hope you had a good weekend. Hey, well, how's it? Um, fantastic. Thank you very much. And hello, Daisy. And uh, yeah, I had a brilliant weekend. Thanks. Um, as I was saying earlier, I I just been doing some some work on my daughter's bedroom and uh, having a lot of fun with that. Oh, yeah, that's it's, a lot of fun. It's great when you use the law of attraction to get things to work smoothly. <laughs> there where you go. <laughs> in, in the past, you've been, you, you've been doing these kind of odd jobs before, but they have not run smoothly. But, yeah, mm, yeah. It's, it's awesome to use the law, law of attraction. It's just been great. So, yeah, we're, um, we're, we're, we've got this uh, uh, great opportunity to talk today. The uh, shop thing is um, you can Wikipedia her, you can um, YouTube her. And seeing the incredible uh, music that she's created, um, I was speaking to uh, Miriam, who introduced me to her, and, and found out a little more about you, Daisy. So I know some secrets there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, so uh, an incredible violinist. And, and as Walt says, um, the thing that uh, sparked me uh, to, to great interest when I watched it well, was the incredible enthusiasm and energy you, you bring to the table, Daisy. And um, uh, as much as I'd like to give you a great introduction, I, I'd rather like to hear the story directly from you because I hear you put down a lot of your uh, success down to uh, the Law of Attraction and the Abraham Hicks teachings. So I'm really excited to hear more, and um, I'm going to hand it straight over to you. How are you? Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I've just been listening to Abraham Hicks since May last year. So what is that, like eight months or something? Um, That's fabulous, though. But since, You're still a noob, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was an amazing way as well that I found out about it. Um, I'm There are lots of, I'm sure you guys are the same, I have projects that I'm working on now, and then I have those pipe. They, they call them pipe dreams, or maybe they're just dreams that could happen in the future, maybe that, you know, sometimes we're doing some work on. And um, one of them is to create a Broadway show. Ooh. So I was working with a director and um, an amazing, yeah, uh, scriptwriter and director and, and a musical director and um, who've done a lot of Broadway work. I hear the stars are fantastic surname. You what? I hear this, this director of yours has got a great surname, isn't it? Um, so there's Michael oh. Feigenbaum, who's the, oh, okay. um, oh, 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 you mean the guy, yeah, that's good, my new record. <laughs> that, he's got a great surname. Yeah. <laughs> that's my new record, we'll get back, get to that in a minute. But yeah, the Broadway show, um, mm. at one point we thought of going in for a festival in New York, which is not there yet, but, um, the New York Fe Theatre Festival where shows that would like to get on Broadway um, do a kind of workshop and all the potential producers come and hear them. So I wrote to that festival to find out about them, and they watched a video, a music video I made, of a song that I wrote mm -hmm. called Country Hope. And the guy wrote back saying, these are the details. By the way, your video is incredible. Are you, are you an Abraham person? <laughs> Wow. And I'm it. like, well, I, you know, I wouldn't know at all what that meant. I just wrote back saying, thank you so much. What the hell are you talking about? But, you know, in a nice way. <laughs> um, and uh, and he sent a link just to a video. And I watched it and I was so excited. I was like, this is my thing right now. And I started mm. listening to it every single time I was <laughs> driving, every single time I was doing the washing up. You know, any moment I found... I started listening to those videos, and the second or maybe third video on YouTube, these are just the YouTube videos that I listened to, uh, said, hey, if you've got some time, take, try to, in the next 30 days, cancel as many appointments as you can, and uh, just focus on only doing what you feel like in that moment. And I took that 30-day course, 
Um, mm. Like that day I had three appointments, none of which had to be done that day. I cancelled them all and I went kayaking, you know, and I just started doing stuff like that every day. <laughs> you know, not really done. Done. It was, it was May last year. I wouldn't do that right now. Um, <laughs> and I had, I had, I had an amazing month. And yeah, then things really started changing for me. I mean, as I said to you, Louis, specifically what I wanted in my life at that time was to have more touring. Um, and yeah, some other things came into my life that I'd never thought, but were like amazing. So now I'm just going off in five weeks on a 30 concert tour in China. Whoa. Um, no, nearly for, I'll be away for nearly two months touring in like the most beautiful concert halls throughout China, 30 different cities. Um, mm. and I've got other tours all in planning, you know, I've got concerts fixed in New York and Mexico, but like all kinds of stuff is happening. It, it's just a whirlwind of, as you know, you said, I'm enthusiastic of really exciting things. <laughs> and then this guy, Felipe de Souza, actually he's, he's just called Felipe. I think they pronounce it Salsa over there in Mexico. Salsa. Yeah, yeah. Um, in Mexico contacted me and he started this company, which is making records. And I've just recorded a new album of violin arrangements of the who, cause that had been one of my dreams. And it was such it, well, we're still in the project. It's such an exciting journey. The music's unbelievable it sounds brilliant on the violin and just working with this whole team of people and everything's paid for you know and just an amazing setup they've got there the joy the bliss of this project and we're working on the album art now um and getting the touring package ready we'll start touring that show it's just like i i tell them every day like guys i, I can't believe how lucky i am to work in this company you know it's so <laughs> mm -hmm. and and, and like the deal I have for the album is I get 96% of everything the album makes and the company gets 4%. Like that, for any artist, wow. even a normal person out there, but any artist is going to be like, I want the number of this company, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, there, there are a whole bunch of people who are, are aspiring artists who are now going to their phones saying, okay, what's the name of the phone, the phone number of the company? I want to call them right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fabulous. I, I, by the way, I wanted to tell you, Daisy, uh, th this is not something most people admit to these days, but I've been a Vivaldi fan for many, many years, and I loved your interpretation of Winter. Very, very nice job. I really like that. It's so fun. And you know what we've done? We've just taken exactly what Vivaldi wrote. I don't know. I've played it with a band, and I've also played it with a band plus a string orchestra as it was mm -hmm. originally written. Right. And all we've done in, we, is we've added the band charts which play a reggae beat along with it. It works not just with me playing the solo line, but with the full string orchestra playing, you know, what they normally play. It sounds so killing. Like, I think the band's <laughs> like, yeah, man. <laughs> It's funny. Most people listening He's are going to say, gun. "Who? Yeah, Who? Who's Vivaldi? Never heard of him. I mean, is he on the charts?" <laughs> <laughs> well, I have the um, other way round. In that, I was brought up in an amazing family. I love my family to <clears throat> bits. They're, you know, in England mostly. Um, I'm dotted around in Europe, but um, we, my parents, just felt that classical music was the most, I guess, well, in their idea, the best education for a child mind to develop mm. rather than rock mm. or rather than different music that was their idea um, i had the most beautiful childhood it was very secluded though in a way very sheltered like no tv radio was just set on classical or some bebop jazz so i didn't hear any other music we you know we were in the countryside i i played with my sister and my brother like we were really secluded so so I had not heard of The Who when I was growing up. And the funny thing is, is so I just heard about it when I came to live in the States, like oh, many, many, many years after The Who had written these songs. <laughs> um, and, and so now I'm telling my family, you know, I wrote them an email saying, hi, guys, I'm making this new album. It's, you know, arrangements of this band called The Who. And all my family still haven't heard of The Who. So, they all went, <laughs> so I'm like spreading the word. <laughs> oh, I'm spreading the word wide, far and wide to people who've never heard of The Who. And, uh, and so they're researching about it, and one of them was like, Daisy, I mean, it seems like they smash their instruments at every <laughs> concert. And, and, you know, I have a 240-year-old, like, very, very, very valuable Italian violin. You know? <laughs> uh, so they kind of looked at me going, well, I hope, I mean, I'm, it's great you're playing the music and you love it, but I hope you're not, like, going to reproduce the way they used to play their concerts. <laughs> 
So I was like, don't worry about it. I'm not going to smash my body in the concert. But I'm going to have a concert. I mean, we're creating the lighting design. It's like projection. It's going to be an amazing show. That's interesting, too, because... So just yesterday, the date, with the, the tickets aren't even on sale, but the New York like release concert of that album is the 16th of June at 4 p.m. I live in Peekskill, just north of New York City. Sure. Uh, there's a theater here, beautiful theater called the Paramount Theater. It's going to be there for any listeners to put it in your calendar. The date, the, the tickets are going on sale. Uh, there's a pre-sale this week um, at some point. So anyway, I, I, I don't actually live all that far from you. I live in the Hartford, Connecticut area. And we have uh, the Hartford Symphony Orchestra comes to our town. Our town is like the Tanglewood for the Hartford. And they, they come to our town, Simsbury, Connecticut, to play every summer. And I think it was either last summer or the summer before, one of their concerts was reproducing the music of The Who. <laughs> How amazing. Isn't that something? How amazing. Mm, yeah. I should come and play there as well. So it's it also interesting. I have to talk with you after this show, but I have a really beautiful um, – concert that we created with different rock songs and some of a lot of my own music for orchestra that we did at Lincoln Center in 2017 the year before last um anyway might be interesting for the Hartford yeah yeah yeah, sure I mean I I know absolutely nobody attached to that at all but I'm sure we can find the right contacts for you that's not difficult yeah (laughs) more of a trash that's right absolutely that's all you do so So, I mean to get back to that you know I do every day I wake up and I actually um, you know, I've listened to so many tapes now, and I'm sure you've listened to even thousands and thousands more than I have. You know, there's this interesting thing that Esther or Abraham often says, when you wake up, you feel good. And I know that I know exactly what Abraham means. In other words, my energy generally in the morning is very good. Um, I know, and I've heard other people say, well, I so what it seems to happen to me is, you know, all the uh negative thoughts that i'm having obviously i'm trying as quickly as possible to change them into positive thoughts but often in my dreams they work themselves through like they Mm. turn into real nightmares so i often wake up having just had a nightmare and i'm like feeling kind of crappy you know and i immediately go into meditation i don't even get out of bed i just go immediately into 15 minutes of meditation and i'm feeling on top of the world like in total bliss you know and i get up and i I'm into that thing that one of the processes she said was scripting, you know, writing about things that you want to happen, maybe for yourself, maybe for your loved ones, whatever it is. So I do my scripting, um, take a shower and make the main point of each day to try to do whatever it takes to stay in a good mood. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm still I'm sure everybody you guys can relate to. This. I want to actually know whether you guys can, can relate to this. I, I still, um, you know, there are certain things that trigger me. And to, to suddenly feel, and I have like a, you know, a lot of darkness. And I kind of, in, interestingly in my music and in everything as an artist, I like to own the darkness and the light. Like it's kind of important mm-hmm. for me, you know. So anyway, I reach, I, I can like have something trigger me and it's never, I think I can say never to do with somebody else. It's something I've done. And I look at myself and I'm like, I'm such an idiot. Like there's total criticism. <laughs> like I'm like, you know, like. I want to literally kill myself right then. Like, how could I have done something? And it's not <clears> something really little where somebody else, like my husband looks at me and he's like, he doesn't really say it out loud, but he's like, I can't believe you just feel that bad over this little thing, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like yesterday, yesterday I went out to see a friend and I left something on the stove. And uh, I, I and my husband took a nap <laughs> while I went out. <laughs> so when I came back, there was kind of sulk, you know, like serious stuff going on. <laughs> um, and I came back and I just felt like, how could I have done that? Like, that was so stupid. And immediately I was like, okay, I've got to feel better. Immediately I did a meditation, felt better. But it's, a, it's amazing how, for me, this is the thing I want to talk to you about. In that moment of feeling total darkness, I mean, like, that real, like, physical, it's like, uh, it's like my whole body is crunching in on itself, you know, my head, my everything. Um, there's, there, is it, it's the momentum, right? There's a part of me that kind of doesn't get out of that. Like, I hate being in that, and yet there's that part of me that I have to force to get out of that. It really takes effort to get out of it. And, and it only Annoying, takes maybe a couple of minutes. <laughs> It's annoying Sorry? that yeah, it's annoying that you actually have to do that. I know that feeling. I mean, I know it very well because I mean, even to this day, there are times where I, I I try not to force myself anymore. I've learned that's really not actually the best way to go about doing it. But many many times, yes. I find myself just in a 
not good place and have to turn around. Yeah. One thing that I have discovered, and I'll let Louis uh, uh, address this from his perspective because yeah. he'll give you some good ideas too. But one thing I've learned yeah. is that um, as I continue to do uh, the meditations, for me, that's my biggest thing to do is mirror exercises, um, you know, various activities that I do throughout the day to help you know keep myself up. As I do more and more of that, I find that the mindfulness, uh, you know, the being aware of, oh, I'm, I'm falling into the crevice right now, comes a lot quicker now, and that happens because of the daily practices. So, yeah. don't 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 beat yourself up about that. I mean, you're, we all go through it. It's normal. It's it's a very common thing. And as you just keep focusing on what you want and, and you know redirecting yourself over and over again, it gets easier over time. That's exactly what everybody says, and I believe that. And so what, when you say the mirror practices, would you like to elaborate on that? I'm interested. Oh, yeah. Uh, th there are a number of people who have written about this. I, I follow the uh, way that Jack Canfield, the author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, writes about it. But uh, Louise Hay has written about it. A number of people have written about Louise this. Louise Hay. Yep. I know I know her book, so. Right. Um, the basic idea is every morning you, you basically go stand in the mirror and you talk yeah. to yourself. You, you take it, you can do the yeah. same thing with a cell, uh, cell phone on selfie mode, but you just yeah. com have a conversation <laughs> with yourself and the whole purpose don't of the even conversation. Don't have to get out of bed. Don't, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, you just have a conversation with yourself telling you how much you love yourself, how much you appreciate yes. yourself, talking about all the wonderful yep. things that you're doing in your life and how great your day is going to go. And here's what you're anticipating. You can do your segment intending. I mean, you just do all this stuff talking to yourself. And when you do that, I, do I get that. very, very close to the mirror so that I can really look into my own eyes to do it. And when yes. you look into your own eyes and talk to yourself that way, it starts to build up your self-confidence, your self-love. You, you cut yourself a lot more slack. You basically give yourself a lot of reasons to just feel good about yourself. And, and, and for me, that's where my biggest uh, improvement has come. I, I haven't been quite as successful with the meditation. Louis is like the meditation expert around here, so I'll let him address that one. But that's how I do mirror exercises. I'm going to do that. I love it. Thanks so much. Louis, yeah, over to you. <laughs> uh, Daisy, my question to you based on, on, on your statement would be simply, what do you believe the importance is of negativity and negative emotion? Why is it Definitely. so primarily important? Why? Oh, well, I mean, to follow the teachings, which I completely do sincerely, mm -hmm. like, uh, flow with, you know, I really see the truth in. It's to produce a new desire. The so expansion of the universe. At it, yeah. You could look at it as your expansion tool, can't you? Absolutely. It only happens through so us. You, you come into the physical universe, this contrasting universe, and you come in to play with contrast. So when you know right. what you don't want, you have a better idea of what you do want. That's so right. So when, when you get to the understanding that everything's always working out perfectly for you, you understand that when it goes wrong, it's working perfectly for you, okay? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay? So, so what we're really looking to achieve when, you, when you're getting more advanced, Abram Hicks, you're looking to achieve step five. That's right. Now, you've heard that many times. So yes. step five is when you, you, you come back and you see the whole place full of smoke and all the rest of it, and you say, oh, my gosh, I know I'm never going to do this again. Isn't that great? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> I mean, I really loved, there were some things that were really beautiful, like um, I kept saying, you know, so when I, I immediately went to the meditation and felt my inner being just like mm. not worried about this at all, but, it, you know, I would yeah. go into the meditation, feel amazing, come back out of it, feel good for a while, and then feel crap again, go back, you know, so it was like, it, w it would take like a, yeah, yeah, you know, a few like yeah, efforts. It gets, it gets to, quicker and quicker and quicker as, as yeah. you practice it. But I definitely felt, I, I told myself my inner being loves me. But the mirror thing's great because it definitely, in my case, yeah. you know, I don't seem to have negative energy really towards other people. I mean, not that I can think of it right now, maybe. But basically, it's like always directed at me. But towards other, yourself? You know, other people also feel that. I've heard people go on the tape saying, you know, it's always like myself who gets my own shit. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so it's in that moment to tell myself. I really love myself. Or even just if that's difficult, my inner being really loves me. My inner being mm. loves and appreciates me so much. Like in that moment, you just flip, you know, you don't feel the darkness so much, I think. Mm. So, so Daisy, um, just so I can break down what you're doing. So what you're doing is, is when you hit that negativity, you don't try and deal with it. You go and change the subject. You raise your vibration, you use meditation to maybe not even change the subject, but stop thinking. 
that you raise your vibration, then you go back and look at it to maybe see how you can improve it. So right. that whole process gets shortened and shortened until you get to step five is where, where you're actually seeing it and immediately looking at the rocket of desire that comes out of it. Yes. And then you ride that rocket instead of staying behind. So right. it's, it's, it, it's not changing the subject. It's actually using the subject to shoot forward into, where, into the positive area. Yeah. Love it. So that's where you get to actually experience the idea of walking into the smoking kitchen and say, <coughs> okay, I love <coughs> the fact that, <coughs> that this is a great, great growing <coughs> moment. <laughs> that's, that's how you know you're right, right on top you of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and when that happens, it's, it's, it's quite an experience. The, the step five, when it really happens yes. to you, when you in the midst, midst of that negative stuff, and you're instantly turning it around. It is, yeah. it is very empowering, very powerful. It's very beautiful. It's, it's, it's quite, it's, it's quite a trip. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. So the Abraham Hicks teachings have actually really influenced, um, like the concept of my album art. I'd already been well, I guess even with the concept of the whole album. So, yeah, I started listening to Abraham Hicks in May, and then I got this – well, I signed the contract with the new company uh, that July the 1st. So I started recording and doing all the pre preparations for the recording of the album after that. And so, like, the album – my album art is me. Like, it's a photo. It's me, but it's a conceptual. I mean, uh, sitting – well, first of all, yeah, okay, so sitting, um, just looking in a really beautiful red plush chair, kind of gold, you know, gold or ornamentations on it. Um, and then I, the, the room that I'm in is a kind of warehouse, like gritty, grotty, that kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and on the floor are pieces of glass the idea is kind of from a broken mirror um that reflect a beautiful blue sky just like where you are louis uh but mm. that's impossible because you see that i'm in an enclosed room and the idea is that in this situation and and there's also light streaming in we haven't quite finished you know we're like constructing the picture we're going to do the photos in a couple of weeks but maybe light streaming in through the smashed glass so like you said you've got the smashed glass in other words that kind of you got you, you got to know what you don't want part and then you got you've got and to then know the what you do streaming want through. so i've got like light bigger kind of, than what you don't want yeah yeah and, yeah. Then, and then the idea is that you can be Absolutely. in a situation and i was really thinking about this very funny you know i'm in this apartment which still smells you know this morning i can still smell a little bit the smoke and everything uh, <laughs> it, it looks good though. reminder <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you know i can be in this situation and feel amazing that's the idea of the whole concept, kind of, of this mm -hmm. album art. Um, you know, that it you sounds notice. like uh, the whole album is based around step fiving. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, dealing with little emergencies here. <laughs> and you got your cat joining you again. Yes, uh, well, I have both cats. <laughs> One cat just opened the door while I'm in the midst of the uh, the broadcast, so I had to try to deal with a couple things, but that's all right. They're cute. They're wonderful. <laughs> That's what I get for not latching the door. That's all. <laughs> it's very simple. <laughs> Put up with the scratching sounds. You know, shh, shh, shh. Okay, let me in. <laughs> but, and uh, it does. I, 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 it reminds me, like, something's really interesting for me. It's always interesting things for me, um, you know, going on in, like, my perception of life. But the idea of the perception. I had something really interesting with my album where, you know, me and the, all the band members and all of the sound engineer and the people who had helped. I kind of, kind of, like, had the vision of all the arrangements, but I had a guy writing all the charts for me. Amazing genius. All these people genius. The producer. We'd spent months, you know, uh, um, you know, preparing for this album, recording. And then we get there to the studio. We're all so excited. It's this one of the best studios in the world. It's an amazing studio. And we spend the morning getting all the sound, like making sure the drums got the right sound, each instrument, you know, working everything out. And then we go for lunch. 
at lunch. We're so excited. We can't wait, Harvey, to go back. We go back after lunch and we start recording and we make a killing first recording. You know, the first take is like killing. And then we're like, well, let's go and listen, you know, to make sure everything's sounding how we want. And so we go in and we're all very hyper, but maybe particularly me. And when I listen back to the recording, because I'm so kind of overhyped, I think the recording mm. sounds boring. <laughs> I know we've killed it, but I like, I'm like, oh my God. You know, I had so much fun creating the arrangement of this song. I love this song so much. I love playing it. The band, I thought we're killing it. And now maybe we're making a boring album. And I, I was so, again, I immediately had to, you know, to try and make myself feel better. And everybody in the whole room of this mixing room, you know, who really wants me to feel good, that's the most important thing, were like looking at me going, Daisy, you, you don't like it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I was like, Can, I think we just should move on to the next song because, I, you know, I just, I just need to feel better. And, and, and anyway, the next day I came back to this recording with just having relaxed. We'd done some more takes, done some more songs. We did a good day, you know, had a good sleep, came back the next day. And I went and I was like, I'll just come a bit early. I'll just listen to that take again. And I nearly mm. cried. It was so good. Mm. And of course, if I'm mm. listening to an album, I, I put on music, not because I want it to sound overhyped. I mean, that's, I'm, I don't listen to that kind of music. You know, I don't listen to kind of acid kind of music. So anyway. And I even listened to the original Who, and I'm like, yeah, it doesn't sound overhyped. In fact, in fact, I kind of even felt like ours, ours was like even more energetic than theirs. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the amazing thing to me was the difference in which I felt about this same take, just depending on my mood. So like, as you just said, Louis, like that perspective, it, everything's about the perspective in which we look at our life. Everything. That's true. Perspective. And that's not only, to do with the mood, you know. Perspective also drives. I, I uh, many, many years ago, when I was in my 20s, I played in, in a rock band. And we, we made a, a demo tape in a studio. And one of the things that I noticed right off was how it sounds so much different in the studio than it does in a live performance. I mean, just dramatically different. Re you know, remarkably, incredibly different. It just everything sounds completely wrong. It just sounds wrong. And you have to kind of get used to it. It's a different sound. It's a sound that anybody who has ever purchased music says, oh, yeah, that sounds perfectly normal, but not to the musician. The musician is used to how it's always sounding in the live environment. And that's a hard thing to get around at first. But once you get so used to it. you probably have the same feeling. Oh, yeah, I know that especially, feeling. As, especially that feeling of this is it. Mm -hmm. This is the recording that everybody's going to listen from right. now forevermore. Exactly. exactly. This is the recording that, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands of people are going to buy and it feels like in a show, you're just like flowing. I mean, the energy's flowing yeah. through you and you're like in bliss kind of and connecting and the oneness with the audience. Everybody's going, you know, crazy. And you're not in that kind of like uh, perspective of potential criticism, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, and of course, you've got everything around you and it's happening in the moment. And then you listen back. It's like, you know, it's like uh, nearly like. The inner being never looks back, so there you have to look back a little bit. <laughs> and you touched on it when you when you are a live performer. Now I've never performed for the kinds of crowds that you've performed for. Mine were like you know 100 people if I was lucky. But um, you know when you're in that kind of of environment, even a small audience like that, that audience feeds you energy in a huge huge way. Mm -hmm. And and when you are deprived of that energy in the studio environment, you may not consciously know what it is, but subconsciously you're really aware of it. It's like, where did it go? Oh, oh, absolutely. You know, I'm so, so my bliss for me is in the performance situation. And I always say, people say it must be great having people watching you. I don't actually feel like that. I don't feel like people are watching me, even though they are. Well, in a way, I feel like I'm opening to, you know, my inner being. Sort of I'm opening to the spirit of the world, my soul, whatever it is. And so is everybody in the room. It's right. like we are all in that situation of being completely with our inner being if we want to talk about it in the you know and with our soul with our spirit and that is what makes me and everybody so high mm -hmm. anyway Absolutely. i that's one of my bliss is the performance and then the other bliss is the creation because and i've been really influenced by abraham hicks in this way in so many ways but in my creative way because she talks so much about all these artists who've died who now all they want is to help the artists who are still alive <laughs> so i've been saying mm. okay i've been opening to freddie mercury one day opening to prince another day i've been opening to michael jackson i've had like this this feeling of these artists energy flowing through me and it is 
it's bliss. I mean, I can't think of any word to say to more describe this euphoric feeling. So for me, the creative moment and then the performing moment is kind of what I live for. You know, mm-hmm. um, it's kind of my bliss, my meditation, my my feeling. The same feeling of meditation I get in those moments. And then there's the recording, <laughs> <laughs> which is nearly a you know, which is nearly a more. It's kind of, but it's not the same high. It's more like a kind of. Well, you really get into the emotion of what the music is in that moment, but it's not quite the same high. And I and I found that, in fact, when I was just being very relaxed and kind of calm and kind of feeling normal, then I would really play a good take, you know. Absolutely. It was really interesting. Yeah, it was amazing. You mentioned Freddie Mercury, and I just watched that new movie. Bohemian oh. Rhapsody. And uh, when, they, when they're creating that Bohemian Rhapsody, and they've yeah. got this little house and, and they're sitting yeah. there and they're having all their struggles, but he's getting it perfect. He's getting all the bits and pieces and the sound. He goes over it again and again and again. I mean, it's yeah. like the weirdest song on the planet. If you listen to it outside <laughs> the norm, um, you know, right. it's just like, what? And yeah. I mean, even that producer threw it out, you he know. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, what an amazing song. What an absolutely oh. incredible piece of music. And as Abram says, you, to, to kind of explain, a little bit of how, how it works is, you know, you have the situation and everything, everybody's saying things perfectly. Like I was thinking, uh, Pink Floyd and Freddie Mercury and Bohemian Rhapsody and then you mention it, you know, and it, it, it's the timing. It's the timing. And, uh, it's very difficult to explain to anybody about the timing when it's fixed on a video and somebody's watching it back, you know, or something, you, you can't really, you know, I've got all these things around me in this forest here and, and, and there, there's certain things that, the fly hit me just now at the right time. And you know, it's just the timing. You can't tell everybody about the timing. And it's the timing that is, that is the thing that, that, that kind of sparks everything off. Wow. At this Absolutely. Time, how did it... Yeah. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that movie. It was, it was quite an eye opener for me. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I. Having listened to the music forever and know nothing about it. <laughs> right, right. Pretty, I felt quite kind of similar as well. Like Queen's one of my favorite bands of all time. And mm. I knew a bit about Freddie Mercury, but yeah, this was, it was so inspiring. And it was the day after I'd watched that film that I was like, Freddie, he was like, I'm right here. I was like, come on, let's have some fun. <laughs> it was like, and we had some real fun doing an arrangement that day. I felt literally I just had hours and hours of feeling like I'm with Freddie, Freddie Spirit. So my yeah. feeling, not that Abraham's talked exactly about this, but, or maybe he has and I haven't listened to that tape, but my feeling is when we die, um, we can be everywhere at the same time. We can be with thousands of artists at the same time. Absolutely. And I have often felt when an artist dies, you know, when Michael Jackson died the next day and, and then the next weeks, I felt him with me every day. It was so inspiring and, you know, just in such a powerful force of positivity, um, not just in writing music, but in every aspect mm. of my music, every aspect of my life, really, every aspect of wanting to live my dreams and all that kind of stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, and, and I have had even, even before any of this, uh, I've had visions of, you know, Janis Joplin had came to me in two visions. You know, I was just relaxing a couple of times and I had visions of her saying, this is what you should do. And I, they were pretty out of the, out, out of the, like, totally okay. out of anything I felt like I could have thought of ideas. Um, she was the one saying you should go to New York. I, I live, you know, just north of New York City now, but I'm from London, as everybody probably can hear from my accent. <laughs> and I was in a band um, which was going to split up. So I was kind of wondering what to do. I was already living in Austria and Vienna at that time. So I was thinking I'll probably go back to London. Um, but she said, you've got to go to New York to be a solo artist. Um, this was not my own band that I had in Vienna. It was a string trio. So I was used to being in a it's the chamber music group, you know. And I just was like, what the hell was that? And I kind of like had it in the back of my mind, but I wasn't ready to, what do you mean, New York? At what? Like, you know. <laughs> but, um, and, and then, and then of course, things started happening. People started <clears throat> like, I, I was touring around the world anyway with this group. So you meet other musicians at festivals and they would be like, listen, I've got a, I've got a group in New York. Why don't you come and do a tour with us? Why don't you, like all this stuff in New York started coming to me all the time. I was like, Janice, oh, my God. And and it took me about a year to say, okay, I'll try it, you know, because for a year I was like, no way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just like just like Esther sometimes says, if she knew she'd be doing this, she'd be like, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, now I'm, of course, now I've been, lived in New York for 13 years or New York City for four years and up here for nine years. 
Um, and yeah, I've, I've been a solo artist all that time. I've, I've done it. So it's, it's one yeah. of those things that's really strange when you're first getting used to listening to that inside voice. And it, for me, it was more about trying mm -hmm. to actually notice the voice and actually trust that I was really getting a, you know, an inside message. Um, lately I've been getting better at that, but it can be hard to follow that message because, especially like you say, if, you know, it, it flies in the face of conventional wisdom, right? And that's what you had to do, but you did it. You weren't brought up that way. Yeah, that's right. So, so I guess my first question is, good for you. How did you convince yourself to follow that voice? I mean, it was, oh, okay. So the specific New York thing was that not only did I get job after job after job, I met a guy as well um, who, you know, I, I formed a close friendship with um, a very successful musician in New York City. Um, he played in Miles Davis's band for many years, like all these like kind of names that for me were like God icons in, in the music <laughs> world and in the New York music scene. And he heard me play and he said, I think you're going to do really well in New York. And he just kept saying that. Yeah, I think so. You know, I really think so. And <clears throat> it was a combination of all this work coming of um, I had an aunt she's died now but I had a very I was very well I became very close I had a lovely aunt who had spent her whole life really living in New York I didn't know her that well uh, I went to stay I just went I'll come and stay with her for two weeks and I really the city spoke to me you know how, how things speak to you I, I felt this incredible excitement um, and finally it was a kind of I guess like everything a letting letting go of the resistance right and then I finally said I'll come here for a year <laughs> Well, that's you know, it. and then it turned into two years and then I met my husband and then I was like, I guess I'm staying, you know. Um, but the, the inner voice thing, you know, it's th that's why Abraham Hicks for me is so powerful because it talks about the feeling. Even I, I still I'm so proud of myself. So the thing that catches me up the most, everybody has their conventional wisdom, like you said. And for me, it's um, being able to not just say no, but um, I, I've had a really important kind of change in the way I'm thinking and I'm sure it will change again and again but right now uh, I used to well Louise Hay says this thing you, you are you, or you receive what you give and a lot of people it's about giving giving well I would like to change that in my particular where I'm at now to you get what you think um, you know you get what you feel and what you think so I'm I consider myself a giving person like maybe we all do you know and I give a lot and and it, it actually was to my detriment in the way that I would try to um, want to solve other people's problems, which are really for them to solve anyway, and it's for their journey, uh, to the detriment of myself, do things that were not good for mm -hmm. me um, to try and help them because I would feel that their problems are worse than mine or something like that. Um, and that is a, still is an ongoing thing for me where I, you know, I'm so proud of myself every time somebody says, would you like to come to my birthday party? And I really don't want to come. And I'm like, I, I can't, you know. And I'm yeah. uh, just, just to be able to say no to things where I'm like, this is my friend and kind of I ought to go. But actually, mm. no, I'm really in my composing. I'm really. So that is my journey. And even yesterday, you know, I kind of wasn't sure if I really wanted to go out and meet this this friend. <laughs> but I still went and look what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still working on it. I'm still working on the inner voice thing. But yeah, it's that little voice that says, I don't really want to go. And it's okay to not really want to go. Like for me, just allowing yeah. myself to do what I want. That's yeah. huge. It's a trust, big thing. Trust, your, trust your emotional guidance. Yeah. 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 When you trust and that. And not what I think I so, do, what I think I should. Yeah. Sorry. I was just going to so say. So a lot of people. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, a, a lot of people think the law of the attraction is the secret. Okay. We all know the movie, The Secret, and the book, and all the rest of it. But I've come to understand that the law of attraction has been taught everywhere. In every Bible, every religion, it's been taught by philosophers, been taught everywhere. The thing, the thing that I think is a real secret is, is that your emotions are your guidance system. That, that is the one thing that I, I think is the biggest, the biggest key that I've learned. Um, because I, I, uh, and the other thing is, I, I always knew contrast was the teacher. That, that was clear to me because I always knew there would be no light without any darkness, there'd be no mountain without a valley, etc., etc. Um, but I didn't know how to put it into the human context. And when I came to realize that when you know what you don't want, you have a better idea what you do want, and it's wanted and unwanted that is how the contrast manifests for a human. 
that my eyes were, were, were open to a much greater degree. So I think, A, the clarity of the message, um, and B, uh, that your emotions are your guidance. And I, I love uh, Abram's little example. And, and I just wanted to mention, Daisy, you mentioned that Abram was a she in the beginning and Abram was a he later on. So I was quite amused by that. <laughs> <laughs> Very well noticed. I was completely oblivious to it. <laughs> and, and the best part is both are correct. That's it's what I love about it. Because I'm either talking about Esther or Abraham, which is interesting that I'm thinking Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> so many people uh, call Abram a she because of Esther. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah. but, but, but it's still Once accurate. Once you clearly understand because, what's happening. Because if, if, you're, um, if you're receiving beings who are non-physical beings who have cycled through to Earth lifetimes – then it doesn't matter which one you use. Both genders are correct. There are going to be some she's and there are going to be some he's in there. They're both accurate. <laughs> in some cases, it might well, have been a cross dressers. Like, you never know. <laughs> I'm not a male or female. <laughs> <laughs> I just am. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, you're completely correct. Um, sometimes I, I think about my experiences of my past lives as male, female, young, old. Etc. And it's very difficult for me and, and different nationalities for me to, to think in terms of I'm a white South African. That's just it, it's just ridiculous to think like that. It's just it's a concept that is that that has completely eluded me now. To think that and, and it's interesting because now I get along with people that are are very well to do or high high in the society, and I get along very very well with those that are incredibly low in society. And neither of those, or and, and even any religion and any group, it really doesn't bother me anymore. It's become something that is um, of no real consequence. The interesting thing that I'm looking for mostly now is alignment. If I'm looking That's at it. anybody, I'm just looking alignment, alignment. And once you understand the difference between alignment and wanting to segregate different people into different groups, uh, you're looking now for an aligned person in any group, in any shape, in any color, in any religion, in any political motivation, etc. So, yeah, uh, it, it's become clearer and clearer with the Abraham Hicks teaching her how to do that because the understanding of alignment has been primarily important to me. Um, I think without a clear understanding of that, it's, it's not that easy to fully grasp things um, and, and to not have too strong our opinions on anything. Um, and, and to accept everybody, even when they're out of alignment, you know, you can appreciate the expansion tool. It's like, wow, that's so cool. Look, look at all the circumstances they brought together to create this shit for themselves so that they can grow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh God, that changed me so much because every time I went li living up here, the town is called Peakskill. Um, it is, a, I talk about it, you know, I'm sure there's many people who vote for whatever they vote for, I don't want to get into politics, but I talk about it in my mind as a socialist town in the way that there are no homeless people, we really look after each other kind here. Mm -hmm. So I'm used to being here, that's all good, I love that. And then I go to New York City, tons of homeless people, all ages, all color, everything, like, and my heart used to be broken every time I saw them after the Abraham Hicks teachings, I would go down and be like, I just imagine you being blessed with the most incredible growth from this, you know, really taking from this something that that's you're That's when you can so genuinely thankful. smile at them, isn't it? Yes, grateful that's happening. I'm like, wow, look at what look at what you're creating for yourself. Yes, yes, and not feel bad about it, and just see them in the place that I know they would want to be. Yes, that's Put a that energy. skill. That's a and wonderful it, skill. Oh, it's great talking to you guys, and... um. It, it's, it's really interesting that you mentioned about being a white South African Louis because I, not that all British people have this, but I felt like I brought into my life, um, because everything is about it's okay for me to feel good. It's okay for me to put feeling good before anything else. It's okay for me to put in my little world, you know, feeling good before saying yes to or no to a friend. You know, like that. And I, yeah. I feel that that's partly to do with the fact that I was feeling quite guilty as a British person having overrun all of these countries. You know, when I would go to like Africa and see, I, I just feel you like, the guy you know, that England. decimated my country, girl. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, you know, like, like 
like all the England, the, the slave trade, everything that the history of the English Empire had created. Yeah. You know, I felt like I was brought up kind of in that guilt. And um, mm. that was just like you feel you have to work on your things. I felt also I needed to really work on that, which was so interesting um, that we all well, often come as a culture or as a uh, we come into this life. Well, you, 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 you come in with the yeah. vibration of culture that you come in, and that is just thought right. forms. So you come in with this baggage of thought forms and then you have right. to wean your way out of them and, and right. until you become clear of what you believe and what, where you're That's going right. and what you understand. Yeah. 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 That's so right. you shift and you, and you become clearer. You realize that your thoughts create your reality. So yes. let me clean up all those thoughts and, and put in yes. what I want. Yes. And, and let me, yes. let me copy a DM that sees the day and run with it and, and forget yeah. about the past. Yeah. 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 Else's stuff. It's kind of ironic that we we grow up in life trying to learn what the mores are, trying to learn all these things that society is trying to teach us, and then we discover Abraham, and then we try to unlearn all of it. <laughs> it's a very yeah. strange. Thing. Oh my God! What, who was it who said um, uh, maybe Einstein or a really famous quote? One of the friend I met yesterday actually just mentioned this quote, which is like. Life is all about trying to unlearn everything you've learned or something like that. Right. Anyway, um, because I feel like, yes, it is exciting. In a way, Abraham also talks about this. It's exciting to reach your goals. And it's, it's very exciting for me to say to you, you know, the amount of concerts that I've now got and all, you know, all this kind of stuff that's happening in my career. It, it's amazing. It's what I wanted. But the thing that's really exciting is the feeling of change. Like you started the conversation, it's Louis, where today. Where you're going, talking, not where you are. Yeah, where you're going and the way you see that you're reacting differently to things like you were talking about using the law of attraction to really help your daughter with like recreating her bedroom or something like that. You're talking mm -hmm. about doing something like that. And for me, even like I just did my taxes this weekend and I did them in about 10 times quicker than I normally did. And um, Cause, it, cause it you made did, me feel you did so the mental cool. work first. You, you set the yes. vibrational pattern before you yes. did it. Yeah. Yes. And I knew that everything is, you know, like I, I used to spend a, yeah. a lot of time on tiny details, you know, sense, getting every sense right. Um, and now it was more like I know what I know the end result of what needs to be done. Yeah. And what I have done in finding in a mind. quick way to do it. Sorry. You got the average clear in your mind and you're heading towards it. That's it. Yeah. You got the Absolutely. idea of where you're going. Yeah, and cool. it's all about um, having fun. So it's about having fun. And having fun is looking and learning a new way of doing something that you've done the same for the th last 30 years. So I did lots of things in new ways. And it really was fun. I can't believe I said it, but I had fun doing my taxes. <laughs> because also I was seeing the change in myself. That and that, that is maybe the most exciting thing you know and abraham is all about that every day a new a new self and a new change and doing things in a new way and and feeling good one of the things that linda armstrong who does the uh, friday afternoon podcast with me was pointing out is and, and others also point this out here on the show i have daisy you would not believe how many co-hosts i have but <laughs> uh, many of them like to point out that the world is a mirror of what we're thinking about and feeling about and Louis has pointed that out many times, yeah. but that, that mirror icon, that mirror uh, metaphor, I think it's a really good metaphor. It's a metaphor that reminds us that every time that something happens that catches us unawares, that just doesn't, it isn't what we had in mind, you know, something didn't work out the way we wanted it to, something just went completely wrong, it's always a mirror of what's going on in our lives. Um, my, my favorite joke way to express it is, oh, darn, I can't get away with anything. But in fact, the reality is I'm creating all of this. And that, as yeah. I become more and more aware of that and more and more um, cognizant of the fact that everything that's happening there is something that yeah. I, I am doing, it gives me more right. and more of a sense of empowerment. So a lot of people kind of get intimidated yes. by it. I get the empowerment feeling. I get the very strong feeling. You, you know, we, I can see you shaking yeah. your head up and down. So, yes, this is the same thing you're experiencing, right? So, so Daisy, and, Walton, you know, Daisy Walton and I are a big fan of Richard Bach's Illusion book. I don't know if you've read it. Oh, I'm going to get it. Yeah, absolutely. It's if, a, a if you're doing The Who, which is from the 1970s, you've you got to do Richard Bach, which is also from the 1970s. It's the same era. <laughs> awesome. I'll definitely do it. Well, well. Oh, well, do, sorry, says, did you say says, Richard says, Bach? Oh, of course, yeah. of course. And I probably have Jonathan read Illusion. 
Mm. I wouldn't be surprised. But um, Donald Shimoda says to 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 Richard, he says, um, "How many people in the world?" And Richard jokingly says, "Well, there's me." And Donald says, "Oh, I'm so impressed. Now, let me buy you a meal next time." <laughs> and he said, "And uh, six million, six billion other people." And he said, "Oh, no, forget about that meal." Cancelled <laughs> meal. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it's really interesting when you start understanding that you are the only person in your world. Yes. And Walt is the only person in his world, and Daisy's yes. the only person in her world. Yes. Yes. And sometimes we tend to bump into each other like this on a video. Yes. <laughs> and, and that's the fun part for me. And, I love that part. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and then it's you so start like... realizing that you don't have to be confined to anybody else's world. You can do whatever no. you want in your. That's right. Yeah. Right. So what's That's next? That's what I felt as well about the taxes thing, you know. I, I, I kind of knew this is my illusion. I'm creating it. I'm going to do it yeah. how I think is the right way. And actually nothing else will matter. Nobody else is going to tell me what to do. Only in my mind if I let them. Yeah. And you'll only get into trouble if you think you're going to get into trouble. If you're, That's if right. You're That's right. You think you're going to get caught. Yeah. My mentor That's said right. to me many, many years ago, a, a thief is never going to get caught unless, unless they want to be. I said, what? You're talking rubbish. I was like totally thrown by that. <laughs> and it stuck in my mind for all the years until Richard, until, um, Abram Hicks really, well, Richard Buck as well, and the illusion yeah. started pointing it out. But then, um, and then Abram Hicks, uh, really, ah, uh, oh, that's why. That's yeah. Why. Yeah. Um, just briefly, there was this guy who came in the sauna. He said, I just saw an article in the newspaper. I uh, always talking about my sauna buddy. And he said um, there, there was this article about the pedophiles. They got 12 pedophiles and they got nine girls. And the girls were behind the glass and the pedophiles were looking through the glass at the girls. And each one of them came into the room separately and they had to choose one girl. And all of the 12 uh, pedophiles chose the same girl. And from a law of attraction point of view, that made total sense to me. Total sense. Because if you chatted to that one girl, I'm sure you would see the vulnerability somewhere. And if you spoke to the others, you would see the confidence. Um, but it's once great, you start isn't it, to be able to, that, it's great to be yeah. able to talk about that because people who are not ready to accept the responsibility of their life, they will want to kill you for saying they that, you know? Absolutely. But for us, they we can just say, that's it. It's true. I believe it totally. <laughs> and yeah. also, I, I have to say, it's kind of interesting that I feel, um, since I've been doing this, I feel like saying the world is a mirror. You know, uh, people tell me, oh, there's people out there who don't like their job. And I'm like, really? You know, I don't know people like that. Like all the people I'm attracting in my world are people like us. They take responsibility for their life. They're into their self-growth. They're seeing, you know, they know that they're attracting everything to them in their life. It's like, so I, I feel like the world is just full of those people. I only hear about the other people. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I was like, my world is full of, like, these amazing people, and we're all inspiring each other on this journey. And the beauty, of course, is that and that's we, how we get works. to select. We like get to decide. Like. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I still actually do uh, run into lots of people who are in the other kind of world, so to speak, who have that other kind of experience. Um, and to me, that's a good thing, because like you were talking about yeah. earlier, Louis, it, it, it's about learning to appreciate where they are. I mean, uh, you, all, see, yeah. you are also, ta you were talking about that's homeless good. people. You were seeing homeless people and looking at them in an entirely that's different right. light. And that's what I'm trying to practice doing. It's not an easy skill to develop at first, but when you stick with it, when you keep going, you get stronger and stronger and you get better and better at doing it. And all yeah. of a sudden things start to change in your whole experience of, of people like that. The I more, think, well, the, the big secret way, is realizing yeah. that you create your own reality with your thoughts. Yeah. That's and right. by looking at yourself and seeing seeing that this is a truth for you, you start seeing that it must be a truth for everybody. That's it. I was going to say the same thing in slightly different <laughs> words. Knowing that our illusion is an illusion, then we know that their illusion is an illusion. We don't need to take it so seriously as soon as we don't take our own problems so seriously. And I'm, you know, still working on that. But anyway, uh, you know, as soon as we don't, as soon as we are, and my God, step five, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> then, then we can look at their situation and know they're just, you know, having a step one moment. So what? It's fine. Yep. Yep. It takes time. And, and, and you because you're not living their lives, you, you may, they may be having a lot, a lot more step, um, uh, step two moments than you expect. Absolutely. Just because you're not living their lives. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And you know they must be uh, because they're still alive. Yes. Yes. Hmm. 
I had a friend, I mean, talking of homeless, I had a friend who I spoke to yesterday for a completely other reason, and she mentioned to me she's been homeless for a year and a half. I was like, my God, she's 69. And I, I was kind of really shocked wow. by the idea. But she told me, you know, Daisy, I have grown more through this than anything in my life. I'm, Absolutely. you know, and she told me all these amazing angel people who are coming to life and doing incredible things. So exactly what you just said. I'm still like trying to get over it in my mind. So, but anyway, looking at it as, <laughs> as the illusion, she's created it and it's all good. It's like, mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> there, there are times when I still try to get used to the idea that this is all an illusion. Because it certainly doesn't yeah. seem like, I mean, when I hold this mouse, this seems like a mouse. This is, this is not <laughs> empty space. There, I, this is a physical mouse that I'm holding right here. No yeah. one can tell me different. <laughs> well, it, well, it is a physical, it, it is a physical uh, mouse because that's what you have created. That's your reality. Oh, doggone right. it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, that means you've got the power to change it rather wow. than it's not a reality. That's what it means. It's not working. It's there we not go. Working. Where's your one? Louis, oh, pick that one. Are you in England now, Louis? It's such a beautiful day. Are you in the UK? I, I am. I'm in a little forest outside the UK with my kids. They're busy playing in the park. Are you? Are you in? Um, is it London or where is it? Where do you live in, Luke? Uh, south of London. I'm in Kent at the moment, but I live in. in uh, I live in. I live in um, uh, South London. I'm so happy. It's like a beautiful day in England. It's gorgeous. Gorgeous. Have a look. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. it's just beautiful. Can't see much because I'm in the forest. <laughs> no, it's beautiful. I'm loving, I'm just loving seeing you there. It's such a good thing, you know. And my mom, she's been, my mom, you know, lives in England and she's been sending me because there's spring flowers in England. Of course, here we're in New York, it's um, snow. Yeah. Although the sun's out today, wonderful, beautiful day today. But, um, uh, yeah, too, snow, so basically. Good. That won't last very long. We're coming into March. That's when uh, all the snow melt aw melts away and we get the tulips. <laughs> yes! <laughs> From Amsterdam. <laughs> From Amsterdam, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm going back to Mexico soon anyway. <laughs> I love it. Much warmer than I'm sure. <laughs> well, I've got, we've got about Guys, two minutes so left. good to talk with you. I just want to uh, ask one more question. What, what's, what's next on your itinerary? Where are you headed next? Thanks for asking, because I wanted to mention something I totally forgot to mention. Um, so right now, the next couple of weeks are getting everything ready for the touring of the Who's Who show, like creating the projections, the lighting, um, mixing the album, and creating all the artwork for the album. But I'm also, the next concert, like uh, with my band, um, is around here. It's in a beautiful, I'll send you a flyer, maybe you could post it on your site or something. Sure. Um, it's on the 28th of March which is a Thursday. It's at 8 p.m. It's in this, it's in a, um, area just north of New York City called, um, Mohegan Lake, mm -hmm. very near where I live, Peekskill, it's like 10 minutes from here. Um, it's in a church that's been beautifully restored, uh, and made into a winery. It's a beautiful venue. So 28th of March at the winery at St. George, 8 p.m. Daisy Joplin Band. It's right before we leave on the 1st of April for China. So we're just going to play through our China tour show. So it's going to be an amazing show. And it'll be the first time to hear some of our Who's Who music live oh. for anybody. Beautiful. So come and see us. Sounds amazing. Sounds amazing. And, and finally, uh, for somebody who wants to find out more about your band, where, I presume you have a website or Facebook page or something. How yep. do they find out? I'm on all of the social medias Don't and websites and it. everywhere. That's, good. That's for the name. Yeah, so www.daisyjopling.com, and it's D-A-I-S-Y-J-O-P-L-I-N-G.com. So kind of like Janice, but with a G at the end. So daisyjopling.com, everything's there. And of same, you know, Facebook, Daisy Jopling, everything's Daisy Jopling. Twitter, Instagram, you know, LinkedIn, <laughs> everything. <Beautiful. laughs> I'm on the Chinese Weibo now because we're just about to tour China. So oh, very good. But, you know, I'm doing everything. Good stuff. Well, good Thanks, luck with the guys, tour. So I, I hope you enjoy you. Uh, the, the ongoing experience because you seem to be enjoying it so much. So I can't imagine you'll do otherwise. It would be amazing. Yeah, but uh, you know, keep uh, keep letting us know what's going on and and uh, you know, send Thank your you. stuff and so forth. And we'll have to have you back sometime too. That would be awesome. Yeah, the album's released twenty third of May, so maybe right before then we could even have me playing you a bit of music or Ooh. yeah. Yeah, I would like that. Absolutely, right that sounds great. That'd be fun. All right. Well, thank you very much, Daisy. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, both of you. All right. Thanks, Louis. We'll see you all next much time. Much welcome. We'll see you next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Take care, everybody.